There would be no controversy over a Ghostbusters reboot if it wasn't for the fact that the original genuinely is a phenomenal comedy. Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray found a balance of action, comedy, and horror that no one has managed to quite nail down since the 1984 original. Not even Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray, and they tried twice. Most everyone knows Ghostbusters 2, though few remember much about it besides Vigo and the famously dumb Walking Statue of Liberty. Hardly anyone, however, knows about the 2009 video game that was mostly written by Aykroyd and Ramis, starring the vast majority of the fil first film's cast, including known Ghostbusters curmudgeon Bill Murray. It truly is the long-lost original cast Ghostbusters 3 that so many people were clamoring for instead of Paul Feig's New Blood reboot. It's too bad, then, that the game just isn't very good. It's incredible to see the digital approximations of the cast, delightful to hear new jokes and banter that feels faithful to the original movie, but as a comedy, it's derivative and flat, too focused on the memories of fans and not enough on the delivery and frequency of fresh jokes. The real hell of it is, the 2016 reboot doesn't do much better than the game. The new cast breathes life into the series, but the reboot and the 2009 game make many of the same missteps in determining what makes a Ghostbusters experience feel authentic. The 1984 film is a movie that's lived in people's hearts for decades, and on the surface it seems like a simple enough concept, small business ingenuity versus the mystical forces of beyond, as a for-profit venture. So what is it about the franchise that mires its sequels in nostalgia and mediocrity? Why can't these new visions match the sharpness of the original? Why was the reboot met with such hostility when two attempts from the original creative team couldn't reanimate the franchise? The game puts the player in the role of a voiceless rookie. Rookie's all they call you, and background is all your character is. This was done so that the player would be able to effectively hang out with the Ghostbusters, with no intermediary character to pass through. All you get are the real Ghostbusters. All that matters is the original cast. There's a nostalgic sense that Ramis, Aykroyd, Murray, and Ernie Hudson are so inseparable from their roles that it isn't really Ghostbusters without them, and Hollywood has mostly agreed, to the point that although Aykroyd and Ramis were extremely enthusiastic for a third film, Bill Murray's equally extreme disinterest in another sequel foiled plans for Ghostbusters 3 year after year. A post-mortem of this 2009 game by Matt Paprocki of Playboy showed how Murray was the key piece of the puzzle for the game to come into being at all. Ultimately, Terminal Reality, the developer, hired Murray's brother to voice act for the mayor in a desperate bid to get Murray on board, and against all odds it worked. But the article goes on to talk about how Murray only recorded half his written lines, which caused a situation where all the other cast members worked unpaid overtime to cover for him. Without him, without Murray, there would be no Ghostbusters. Yet, there isn't a single line of dialogue he recorded for the game that has an ounce of heart to it. The only other time I've heard a good actor sound this irritated and bored by a script, it was Harrison Ford's narration in the Blade Runner theatrical cut. They could have used a soundboard of Murray from the first two films, and it would have sounded livelier. Nothing tanks a comedy quicker than apathy, and that's all Murray's really willing to contribute to the game. Ghostbusters 2 suffered somewhat from the same problem. Everyone else was having a great time, but Venkman just doesn't seem to want to be there very much. Even in his cameo in the reboot, he plays a mean-tempered skeptic who does nothing but belittle the Ghostbusters and their ambitions, which is pretty accurate to how Murray's behaved around the franchise. Yet in that movie, given the opportunity to scoff at the whole idea, he seems to care very little one way or the other. Harold Ramis, on the other hand, was largely responsible for the tight structure and rapid-fire dialogue of the original film, but he passed away in 2014. Ernie Hudson's a good sport, but creatively is very much the fourth Ghostbuster. He'll always show up and do a great job, but he's not the idea guy. So it falls to Dan Aykroyd to carry the torch for his creation. But could Aykroyd have actually done any better than Paul Feig? It's worth mentioning that Dan Aykroyd had one opportunity to write, direct, and act in a horror comedy that was all his own, once upon a time. It was called Nothing But Trouble, and if you don't remember it, those involved with the movie would probably prefer it that way. It's got a similar blend of the macabre and the ridiculous as Ghostbusters does, but it's disorganized and bizarre in a way that Harold Ramis's tighter writing style would never have really allowed for. It reaches a fever pitch of nonsense when Digital Underground, the rap group that did the Humpty Dance, plays at a shotgun wedding between Chevy Chase and John Candy in drag. It was a flop in a way that Ghostbusters 2 never even got close to. It has, to this day, a 9% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. People had a hard time trusting Aykroyd with studio money for a long time afterwards. Yet, it's undeniable that Aykroyd is the comedic glue that holds the whole original Ghostbusters team together. Race Dance is usually the straight man while Egon and Venkman deliver the punchlines, but his balance is what keeps the comedy flowing. He's got a workman's sensibilities and a no-nonsense attitude, but his rapid-fire jargon is almost more or less complete nonsense. It's a hilarious combination. Stance always confronts the unknown and dangerous with the same grounded balance of determination, enthusiasm, and an occasional dry zinger. 
In the game, his voice acting is the strongest, and the sections where you get to ghost bust alongside him are the ones that truly deliver on the game's promise of feeling like you're in the movies, alongside your favorite actors. It's all because of Aykroyd. The role was tailor-made for him. If you think back on his early work for Saturday Night Live, like the legendary Bassomatic skit, his funniest characters are the ones that temper a low-level manic insanity with a businessman's formality. In the 2016 re reboot, his cameo is by far the best, too, and his closing line of dialogue, I don't work after 10, I don't drive to Chinatown, and I ain't afraid of no ghost, is one of the jokes in the new movie that really vibes with the feel of the old. One of the only things that the new movie actually genuinely mishandles is related to Aykroyd, and it's in not translating the comedic relationships between Ray Stance and Venkman. In the original cast, <coughs> movies, and the game, they are friends, but they're oppositional characters. Stance is a true believer, and Venkman is a shameless opportunist. Ghosts are obviously real, but that does not resolve the comedic conflict between Stance and Venkman. In the reboot, it does. Aaron Gilbert, who replaces Venkman, is just trying to move into the professional sphere and keep a lid on her pseudoscientific past, while she and Abby Yates, who replaces Stance, do have that initial loggerheads between the two characters, they become supportive friends as soon as Gilbert loses her job. As a team, the new Ghostbusters work together better and they like each other more, but that's not really a comedic advantage. On the other hand, the fact that Venkman is an unreliable man and a poor scientist means that as the Ghostbusters go along into sequels, he feels more and more tangential to their success and the existence of the Ghostbusters at large. By the time we get to the game, he's barely there at all. Here's the thing. Dan Aykroyd is executive producer of the reboot, and praised it as having brilliant, genuine performances. He knows exactly what was done with the movie, and he loves it. It even brought to life bits and pieces of previous scripts, like a Macy's Day Parade concept that was supposed to be in the game, but was cut. But the game and the reboot share a deep-seated problem. They think that the action and the gadgets of the Ghostbusters are of equal importance to the character humor, when it was the character humor being given total priority that made the first movie so damn good. You can see this play out in the climaxes of these different comedic ventures. In the first movie, the key master and the gatekeeper were especially funny because so much time had been spent establishing the characters who get possessed as relatively normal and everyday. The are you a god bit and making Stance choose the form of the destructor is so hilarious because Stance is the least likely to have some hideous vision in his heart. So, lo and behold, a ten-story marshmallow mascot. The original film is meticulous in how it plants the seeds of the jokes it uses in the climax way, way back in the character development process, which makes the jokes hit way harder when the punchlines are finally made. The game, by contrast, has you tracking down Ivo Shandor, the architect who built the Zool Hotel. As far as the game's design goes, this means that you spend many of your ghostbusting hours retreading locations from the first two movies. When you finally get to him, there's a last-minute revelation that he had possessed the mayor the whole time, which goes down in my book as one of the most unnecessary revelations in game history. The whole thing has to be awkwardly explained by Winston, and everyone else murmurs seriously as if this meant anything. Shandor the boss fight is against a big art deco demon, though, and that's much more interesting. In <clears throat> all the Ghostbusters scripts, New York is a character of its own. In Ghostbusters 2, they way overshot the mark with that, but in the first one it was resonant. There's a lot of weird shit going on with New York architecture where the true purpose is really hard to guess. Take the Zeppelin docking station on top of the Empire State Building, for example. That's real. The first movie taps into that local peculiarity in a brilliant way, but the game does a pretty alright job of at least trying to follow in those footsteps. It's not character driven, but it's thematically on point. The reboot, though, has a weak climax, chiefly because it has a weak villain who doesn't present enough opportunity for the characters to riff on in a comedically resonant way, like Zool picking on Ray Stance specifically in the first movie. Rowan North, played by Neil Casey, is a resentful obsessive who uses the Ghostbusters' own technology and theories to make himself into a, in an apocalyptic form that kinda looks like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in terms of size and goofiness, but is instead a literal, gigantic, demonic version of the ghost from the Ghostbusters logo. It doesn't work as nostalgia, or action, or comedy. It doesn't present an opportunity for any character humor either, so they shoot it right in the junk and call that close enough for joking purposes. Plus, it's defeated through a deus ex machina of convenience, the Ecto-1 showing up at the exact right moment for no particular reason. For both the game and the reboot, neither the villains nor the ghosts serve much of a point besides being objects and entities on which the special effects are used. For the first movie, they were both taken very seriously as comedic elements. 
The thing that's so great about the Ghostbusters concept is that they're tackling gods, demons, and spirits from outside time and space with do-it-yourself scrappiness. It's got elements of class comedy between the entrepreneurial New Yorkers and the ancient mythical powers. The reboot's Rowan North is ultimately too domestic a villain to make that comedic structure work. He's a small, angry little man with too much mystical power. It would be like if the movies or even the game had made Walter Peck the ultimate villain. None of them did because it's too straightforward and it's too obvious. Rowan North seems to be the villain because that's what the movie itself has had to overcome, a dedicated resistance from a hateful and small-hearted group of obsessives. Take the example of Leslie Jones, who takes Ernie Hudson's place in the reboot. She's been on the receiving end of harassment so public and severe that the founder of Twitter became personally involved, and for no other reason than having starred in this movie as a woman and as a black woman specifically. It's bullshit. There are real-life monsters out there being incredibly shitty about Ghostbusters for some damn reason, and Rowan North is a pretty solid caricature of most of them. But ultimately, his point as the movie's villain is more on this level of meta-commentary about the venom that surrounded the gender-swapped Ghostbusters reboot than as means to just make more jokes. The reboot has a point to make. The original movie only had a punchline to deliver. The reboot made me feel like, having addressed the question if women can be Ghostbusters with a resounding fuck yes they can, the new cast would actually do better in their own sequel, where they could focus solely on the jokes and the ghostbusting, where the character humor would come through more clearly after the bonds they forged in this movie. The game, though, left me with the opposite sensation. They left me feeling like the original cast had done just about all they could do with the franchise and had run out of steam at last. The Ghostbusters video game shows pretty conclusively that just because you get the band back together, there's no guarantee that they'll play the tune you want to hear. There's no replicating the particular magic of the 1984 original. It's lost to time and progress and expectations. It was lost all the way back in 1989 with Ghostbusters 2. It's easy to pretend that the second movie was a fluke, that the true Ghostbusters sequel had to be right around the corner. But after two more attempts at a sequel, the game and the reboot, it's impossible to ignore that it isn't a fluke. It's a curse. Each Ghostbusters sequel is doomed to chase the specter of the first movie's success forever, chasing its warmth, its speed, its effervescence, all of it just out of grasp. Nostalgia doesn't help. Ghostbusters 2, the game, the reboot, they all reuse jokes, characters, and images that did work in the first one, like Slimer. None of them quite land the same way again. Fidelity to the original creative team doesn't help either. Even if you get everyone back together, the years and differences between them have taken their toll. Lines fall flat, warmth feels forced. Even hitting refresh and starting with a whole new lineup of great comedians doesn't help when the movie gives guns and gadgets as much screen time as it does the actresses. There are so many individual elements that make Ghostbusters iconic and allow it to sustain such a wide fandom more than 30 years after release that it's impossible to get them all right even if you did a scene-for-scene -scene remake. If 2009's Ghostbusters the video game really had been the last word on the franchise, it would have been a sad note to go out on. It's a passion project that never quite realized its own ambitions. It's a cast reunion that reminds the player why they stayed apart. But it wasn't. The reboot solved a lot of the problems of the video game by bringing in new comedians and playing to their strengths in the script. But it inherited a lot of problems, too, with its feverish need for brand recognition. Its assumption that cool ways to catch and dismantle ghosts is of equal value to making the audience laugh. Despite its flaws, the reboot has put the franchise back on the map. The curse will remain, however. Until the end of time, each sequel will try to replicate a thing that defies replication, haunted by the ghost of the perfect horror comedy. Thanks for watching. This video and all the videos I do are supported through crowdfunding through the website Patreon. It's where individuals like you pledge a certain amount of money per month to help people like me do their stuff, make their videos and such. And I've been lucky enough to have a pretty strong community of people who are helping me do that. Uh, people who are currently donating $10 a month or more are people like Brad Wallace, Camel, Josh, Amir Aguilar, Dewey, David Gilbreth, Brian Pluckman, Connor Biblo, Chris Kaon, Spyro Sedaris, Pay, David Reed, Ryan Gunst, Sen Gustin, Morden Scanning, Josh Farks, Ashley Rain, Bob Belcher, Chris Larkey, Stephen Lark, Nathan Campbell, Oliver Handleken, Jake Dobbs, Joe Wolf, Comfy Hat, Ron Gervais, Balder Carlson, Nick Cole Hamilton, Dalton Seiler, Ken Young, Nobody, Andrew Steele, Brandon Boat, Niels Buckfrommer, D, Galak, Anax of Rhodes. Angel Headed Hipster, Daniel Mower Myrie, Colin, Rob Clark, Joshua Vivi, Cameron, Dylan Sibley, Yuri Petnes, Wesley M., Sharif Kazemi, 
Harley McAvoy, I Cannot Fly, Brett Guillermo, Noah Duggins, Colby Howard, Divyoth Faust, Tim Marsh, David Fry, Cameron Jackson, Eddie Burton, Nathaniel Tenzar, John Walsh, Carl Gleason, Silas Blatchley Hadson, Martin Karsten, Michael Coonan, Tizer Vicarian, Jeffrey Knudsen, Paul Cocker, Kyle Brown, Sasha Aya, Jack Harvey, Robert Glover, Alex Zolato, Matthew, Brad Carr, Preston Allen, Simo Polakowski, Stephen Potiuk, Jake Mays, Alexander Heavens, Devin Fitzpatrick, Matthew Zender, Trivium Art History, Ivan Marinov, Jacob Robertson, Pierce McBride, Stephen Premel, Andrew Schiffel, Lee Jones, Michael Atwell, Bradley Smith, D. Stex, Rob Tackett, Cassie, Tom, Christian Zacharyanson, Pat Hay, Soeb Sheik, Jake Brennan, Kevin DeBolt, Dennis Clark, Niles D. McDonald, Alexander Leister, Kumarin Vigian, Justin Hughes, Igor Babiuk, Brian Hill, Jared Meyer, Andreas Larson, Kevin Schaub, White Zero, Irvin, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Aaron Albach, Martin Markov, Alexander Dmitriev, Joe Hewison, Aiden AK-47, Gordon Moon, Kimo Heikkinen, Ariel Badger Release, and Jody Warren. Thank you all for helping me make the stuff that I do. Catch you next time. What is it about the franchise that mires its sequels in nostalgia and mediocrity? Why can't these new visions match the sharpness of the original? Why was the reboot met with such hostility when two attempts from the original creative team couldn't reanimate the franchise? The game puts the player in the role of a voiceless rookie. Rookie's all they call you, and background is all your character is. This was done so that the player would be able to effectively hang out with the Ghostbusters, with no intermediary character to pivot is, the 2016 reboot doesn't do much better than the game. The new cast breathes life into the series, but the reboot and the 2009 game make many of the same missteps in determining what makes a Ghostbusters experience feel authentic. The 1984 film is a movie that's lived in people's hearts for decades, and on the surface it seems like a simple enough concept, small business ingenuity versus the mystical forces of beyond, as a for-profit venture. So what is it truly is the long-lost original cast Ghostbusters 3 that so many people were clamoring for instead of Paul Feig's New Blood reboot. It's too bad, then, that the game just isn't very good. It's incredible to see the digital approximations of the cast, delightful to hear new jokes and banter that feels faithful to the original movie, but as a comedy, it's derivative and flat, too focused on the memories of fans and not enough on the delivery and frequency of fresh jokes. The real hell balance of action, comedy, and horror that no one has managed to quite nail down since the 1984 original. Not even Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray, and they tried twice. Most everyone knows Ghostbusters 2, though few remember much about it besides Vigo and the famously dumb walking Statue of Liberty. Hardly anyone, however, knows about the 2009 video game that was mostly written by Aykroyd and Ramis, starring the vast majority of the fil first film's cast, including known Ghostbusters curmudgeon Bill Murray. There would be no controversy over a Ghostbusters reboot if it wasn't for the fact that the original genuinely is a phenomenal comedy. Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray found a